everyone. Thank you for attending my talk. Uh, my name is Nate Bartram, and I am a privacy educator with The New Oil. Um, uh, at The New Oil, we focus on helping beginners who are not tech savvy get started with cybersecurity and data privacy. We focus on things like strong passwords, two-factor tracker blockers. Um, I personally like to go the extra mile. Uh, I, I know a little bit about self-hosting custom ROMs, so I know a little bit more than my target audience. Um, I'm not an expert by any means. A lot of you in this room probably know more than I do. But a uh, few quick caveats. Uh, I'm not a trained economist or historian. I'm just a guy who really likes to learn. I have done my best to research this topic well and provide accurate information. But again, not a subject matter expert. I, I just want to be clear about that. Uh, I apologize if I mumble or misspeak. It's 6 AM here. Um, but uh, And I'm also trying to speak fast to save time. So I apologize to any non-English speakers in the crowd. I actually have a script that I'm reading off of. so feel free to contact me after this and ask for that if I talk too fast. Um, yeah, we'll come back around to that. So uh, just to set some expectations about my talk, um, I'm not here to demonstrate any new technology or prove a specific point. Um, I'm just trying to give us all kind of a quick roadmap of like how we got here, where we are today. Um, in terms of needing something like Monero that gives us digital financial privacy. And uh, that's because personally, I find the more I understand the history of a specific event or subject, the more I understand the modern context and like how we got here and where to go from here. And uh, again, quick roadmap. This is not an exhaustive history. This is an incredibly complex topic. And personally, I believe that everything is connected. Nothing ever just happens because by itself. Um, but today I'm going to do my best to pick a single topic and explore how it's affected us up until today. So I apologize. I'm probably going to skip a lot of things. So uh, I guess let's start from the very beginning. And uh, we'll start, I'm going to focus specifically on debt slavery, but slavery in general predates the written word. And uh, it probably was not practiced on a large scale until we discovered farming just because of logistical demands like feeding and housing slaves. But uh, like I said, I'm going to focus on debt slavery. And I'm going to start in the kingdom of Lydia, which was located in the western half of modern Turkey. And they were uh, between 1200 BC and 546, if anyone cares. Uh, they were a relatively good kingdom in terms of economy. They had a pretty good standard of living and enjoyed a lot of economic success. And the reason I'm going to start there is because they printed the first known coins, which was a gold and silver alloy called Electrum, which I found really amusing because for those of you who don't know, that's a Bitcoin wallet. Um, they, uh, Lydia practiced slavery like most ancient people. And according to one paper I found, debt slavery was kind of voluntary back then, kind of sort of. Uh, legally speaking, citizens who became debt slaves enjoyed a variety of rights to ensure that everyone got treated fairly. For example, there were contracts between the debtor and the creditor. Uh, the debtor's family and property did not belong to the creditor. The debtor could pay off their debt early and fulfill it at any time. And failures of duty led to contractual punishments rather than physical discipline. There was even a special type of debt slavery with additional protections for people who fell on hard times, like during times of famine. And if your debt was considered too massive and you had no chance of paying it off, the government would sometimes help you pay it off. On the other hand, uh, immigrants were not protected whatsoever. So for example, if you were a prisoner of war, you might be subject to involuntary slavery, which is probably not too surprising. But uh, even if you weren't a prisoner of war, foreigners really had no legal protection whatsoever unless the local ruler granted them protection. And even then, that was usually only protection against involuntary slavery. If they entered debt slavery willingly, they still didn't have any rights compared to citizens. Like there was a, that whole contractual instead of physical punishments that didn't exist. And the government that never, rarely, if at all, interceded to help pay off unreasonably large debts. So they were just kind of thrown to the wolves. And the takeaway from this part is that even from the beginning of time, we're seeing situations where the law was specifically designed to keep outsiders down through financial means. The law was explicitly designed to grant extra protections to some people and not to others. And in some cases, those protections would be considered basic human rights, like, you know, not beating somebody within an inch of their lives. But, and this was enforced through uh, financial means. So from there, I'm gonna go ahead and jump to China. And that's because China invented paper money around the 11th century AD during the Song Dynasty. And 
I, I suspect that slaves in ancient China were treated a little bit better than some of the other parts of the world. And the reason I think that is because my research had said that some people willingly entered debt slavery in order to evade taxes, which, I mean, I hate taxes as much as the next person, but that's a lot. Um, these voluntary slaves were considered a higher class than involuntary slaves, like the prisoners of war or the criminals, but they were still, you know, slaves below the commoners. And slavery in general, as a general practice, declined during the Song Dynasty, which I find interesting because the Song Dynasty was one of the biggest economic peaks in Chinese history. Uh, so I just, I find that interesting, cor uh, you know, it's correlation, not necessarily causation, but, or maybe it is, but, you know, the, the better the country did economically, the more freedoms everyone enjoyed from the top to the bottom. And unfortunately, this economic boom was right before a period of inflation uh, due to the inability to properly regulate the printing of paper money, which later played a role in their collapse alongside years of war with by neighboring dynasties and eventually the Mongol Empire arrived. So, um, yeah, but I mean, obviously China's still here, so they recovered. Now, <clears throat> Greece is, is interesting because in much of the ancient world, women enjoyed a lot more freedom than uh, at, at least I would expect through stereotype and the media. Like, for example, in ancient Sumer, women were legally equal to men. Uh, in ancient Egypt and ancient India, both women were exactly the same as men. The only thing that held them back were their, was their social class, which was the same thing for men. Like your social class is your social class. Women in India even got to pick, uh, excuse me, women in India even got education and got to pick their husbands at a later age. But this unfortunately all went downhill with the rise of the Grecian Empire. So in ancient Greece, women were not legally people. Um, they were actually under the guardianship of their fathers until they married, at which point the husband became the guardian. Women could inherit property, uh, but they couldn't buy property, and they could only enter into petty contracts worth less than a measure of grain. I don't know how much that is, but doesn't sound like a lot, to be totally honest. Uh, they could not become politicians, scholars, poets, or artists, and even freed female slaves could not become legal citizens. Now, for context, Spartan women around the same time were treated very differently. Spartan women were still legally excluded from politics, but because the men were off to war all the time, they were given a lot more legal privilege. And by the 4th century BC, nearly half of all Spartan land and property was owned by women. So as a result, by the time we hit the Common Era, or AD, some of the wealthiest Spartans were women. And as a result of this, Spartan girls were educated the same as boys. Uh, Spartan women enjoyed a lot more freedom in Athenian society. So uh, once again, we're, we're seeing the, the kind of point that I'm making where uh, it's, it's the financial, there, there's that correlation between wealth and freedom. The more freedom that uh, people have, or the, excuse me, the more wealth people have, the more freedom when there's, there's nothing keeping them down. Uh, Spartan women, for example, got a lot of, uh, they were able to like fund public works and they were able to be active as like poets and scholars and things like that. And then with the rise of the Roman Empire in the first through sixth centuries, women finally began to gain rights again. Freeborn women were able to own property. They could attend games and other entertainment. Girls were given equal property inheritances if the fathers did not leave a will. Women kept the property they entered into a marriage with, they could refuse consent for sex, and they could divorce their husbands if he beat her. So again, um, because of this, women started to become wealthier, which opened new doors. And uh, we, we do have to talk about the Black Death very briefly. I mean, it was one of the most significant events in human history, so I can't just blow right past that. Um, the Middle Ages began around the 5th century AD, and this was following the collapse of the Roman Empire, but feudalism really hit its peak between the 9th and the 15th centuries. And most of us probably know the basics of the system. The uh, king was at the top, the nobility owned land, peasants worked for the land in exchange for protection, and also the church was in the mix somehow. The medieval European economy was primarily based on agriculture. So it stood to reason that the more land you had, the more wealth you had, and the better quality land as well. So you had more status. Now. This was also when we saw the rise of divine right, where the king is the king because God said so, and the king has all the land because he's the king, and because he has all the land, he's the most powerful person, and it just becomes this really circular logic. But because of divine right, the king also had the power to play favorites. He owned all the land, and therefore it was his right to assign the stewards to manage the land. 
And therefore, he controlled who became nobility by controlling who had the wealth. Now, it's it's a little hard to get a full picture of like what the quote unquote financial regulations were at the time, because each lord, uh, each nobility noble kind of made up their own rules. But as long as they didn't, and as long as they didn't rebel and they kept their obligations to the king, the king kind of just let them do whatever they wanted. But there were some commonalities. So, for example, uh, land was typically typically passed down through the family, father to son. And if there was no son, the land was usually turned over to the church. Now, that's not really like regulation, that's more tradition, but I do think it shows that clear concerted effort to keep opportunity and wealth out of the hands of the lower class and keep control over them. Because, you know, there was never really a case where the noble didn't have a son, but he passed it off to his hardest working peasant or something like that. It, just, it didn't happen. And uh, again, there was no upward mobility. So, uh, in theory, there was, because you could become a page, which became a squire, which became a knight, and some knights were promoted to royalty or nobility if, if they performed well in the battlefield. The squires almost always came from wealthy and noble families. So, you know, if you were born a peasant, there was almost no way out of that. Um, getting ahead of myself. And peasants, as you can imagine, didn't have a whole lot of rights. They, like, they couldn't even marry without permission from the lords. Uh, they had to turn over the food they made. They had to pay taxes and rent in addition to that, and they had to serve the knights. And in some cases, peasants were allowed to hold land on behalf of the nobles, but this was always more of a temporary management role. It was legally not their land, and the lord could come back at any time and demote them back to just being another peasant working the fields. Uh, there's also serfs, just real quick. Uh, serfs weren't actually peasants. They were a class below peasants in between slaves and, and peasants. They were not allowed to travel, they were not taught how to read and write, and in addition to farming, they could also be forced into other servitude, like cutting firewood and repairing castle walls. And also when a serf died, their family owed a death tax. So um, pretty much the only legal protection they had was they could not be bought or sold, and they were entitled to justice if they were wronged by another peasant. But again, we're seeing that you know wealth is being kept out of the hands of other people to exert control. And then came the Black Death. And exact numbers vary wildly. Some people say the Black Death killed about a third of the population of Europe. Some people say it was as much as 60%. But it, it, what it did do is it caused so many people to die that demand for labor skyrocketed. Wages soared. Uh, furthermore, so many people died that property inheritances became very saturated. You know, one person might have half of their family die and they inherited all of that property and land and, you know, what little land there was. And so all of a the sudden, there was a group of people who had a little bit of money. They weren't necessarily nobility, uh, a.k.a. the middle class. So this sudden shift of wealth also brought more freedom and an end to the feudalist era. OK, so around this time, there was also a turn towards religion, which is pretty common in times of crisis. You know, people want the plague to end, so they start praying more. And this led to a rise in the power of the Christian church which led to a rise in persecution. And as a result, there was a mass exodus of other religious and ethnic groups from the more oppressive parts of Europe to the more accepting parts. Notably, this led to a group of Jews fleeing the Spanish Inquisition and settling in Italy, where they began to set up what are known as merchant banks. And this was the start of modern banking. Now, uh, this is actually a really interesting case study. I really like this story. So in Italy, a lot of the Jews were attracted to the grain industry, uh, which operated very similar to a futures market. They would loan out to farmers now in exchange for a cut of the profits from the crops or the crops themselves. And the thing is, in the Christian world, the church had banned the collection of interest because the Bible explicitly forbids the collection of interest in two separate parts. But Jews are obviously not Christian, so they could charge interest. So they were loaning money out at a discount and collecting at a higher rate of interest. And so before long, a lot of them had built these really successful merchant empires. Some of them became so sex, uh, excuse, eh. <laughs> excuse me, it is really early here. Uh, some of them became so successful that uh, they actually started doing insurance because, you know, if the farmer they were loaning against had a bad year, you know, drought or something like that, then they had to be able to source that, that promised good from somewhere else. And some of them also expanded into business to business services, like settling trades on behalf of others and even accepting deposits and managing services. And ironically, this trend would continue right up until uh, the creation of something that they called court Jews, 
who were basically the personal bankers for wealthy European nobility, which were the same people that drove them out of Western Europe and created this very industry. So uh, here we're seeing another point in the story, which was that the immigrants were able to flourish because there were no laws holding them down. Uh, when I did my research, I didn't find any indication that there was any sort of like black market or any kind of political friction. You know, people had to get laws changed. I didn't find any indication of that. So to me, that tells me that when there's no laws holding people that back, then there's doors open for opportunity. And even a foreigner who historically has always been the outsider who's less protected, even they're able to come in and find opportunity and success because there's nobody purposely keeping them down. Which uh, the state probably regretted that later, but you know, sucks to suck. So the next step in the evolution of finance was central banking, and this started around the 17th century. Banking became increasingly important, important to the state to fund their various wars and probably other stuff, which led to both the central bank and banking regulations. Uh, the earliest known central bank is considered to be the Bank of Amsterdam from 1609, but most central banks are based on the Bank of England, which was created in 1694 which was to help finance the Nine Years' War. They were so effective that in just 12 days, they had raised the 1.2 million pounds needed to finance the war, which also led to the construction of the English Navy. Now, it's worth noting that the bank at this time didn't really have a lot of the authorities that we consider part of a central bank. Like, they couldn't regulate the value of the currency, uh, they were not the only printer of banknotes, and they didn't just finance the government these functions would come over time. For example, sole printing authority, the only ones who could print banknotes, that came in 1844 with the Bank Charter Act. So from there, the practice of banking just kind of spreads around the world. And again, I noticed another reoccurring theme here when I was doing this research. The Bank of England was founded to fight the Nine Years' War. Uh, Canada, India, and New Zealand all established their central banks after the Great Depression in the early 1900s. Many African and Asian countries created central banks right after they got their independence from colonization. Uh, India's was nationalized after they gained independence. China created one in 1979 when they began to embrace capitalism a little bit more. And even here in the US, the central bank was almost dismantled, except that that was proposed around the War of 1812. And the Republicans in power at the time, the Jefferson Republicans, if you want to be technical, they realized real quick they had no money if they did that so they they kept bank so the takeaway from there that i noticed is that central banks give countries power stability and international presence it's it's almost like a, the way that the financial regulations exist to oppress individuals the central bank is used to do that on a global scale all right so uh we're moving into my last section here and i'm going to talk about credit Credit is not a new concept. Um, the earliest known example was called a tally stick, and that dates back to prehistory. At very least, we know that credit was common enough that, number one, the Code of Hammurabi uh, talked about it. They established a cap on interest rates and things like that. And number two, we talked about debt slavery was a thing. That's kind of where we started. But it didn't really kick into high gear until the last 100 years or so. So... Um, <laughs> I also just want to mention the earliest mention I could find of a, a systemized credit system goes to the Islamic Golden Age between the 7th and 12th centuries AD. Um, and in fact, the mer merchant banking I mentioned a minute ago was perfected based on the groundwork laid by the innovations from that time period. So uh, apologies to any Muslims in the crowd. Uh, I don't want to blow past their contributions. There were a lot of really positive advancements made during the Islamic Golden Age in like science, economics, math all kinds of things, but they're, they're very broad. And um, in, in this particular topic, there weren't any specific ones to narrow down on, but they did play a very critical role in world history. So uh, the earliest instance of modern credit that I was able to find was a group of English tailors who met regularly starting in 1803 to share information about customers who didn't pay their debts. So they were just kind of warning each other. 23 years later, the Manchester Guardian Society was formed and began issuing a monthly newsletter about people who were not paying their debts. So just kind of growing on that. In 1864, the Mercantile Agency in New York created a formal ranking system for the credit worthiness of companies. And then in 1899, the retail credit company was founded in Atlanta to collect data on American citizens and individuals. Cars really put the practice of credit purchases into high gear, pun slightly intended. In 1908, the infamous Model T cost about $850. 
And according to my research, the average take home pay in 1905 was about $780. So you can see how this would have been a difficult purchase for a lot of people back then. So in 1919, GM saved the day by creating the General Motors Acceptance Corporation to provide consumers with auto loans. The first credit card entered the scene in 1950. It was called the Diners Club card. It was used for travel and entertainment and the balance had to be paid off every month. The next year, Franklin National Bank introduced the first bank credit card and in just two years, so between 1950 and 1953, there was a total of 60, 60 credit plans total. By 1958, revolving credit, which is where it doesn't have to be paid off in full at the end of each month, was commonplace. And by this time, Experian and Equifax were already on the scene and they were literally just scouring newspapers and clipping out important articles like marriage announcements, arrest reports, any, any kind of public notice and tacking them onto index cards to make credit, physical credit files. In 1960, there were 60 million credit reports issued. Um, the US population at that time was just under 180 million, so that was about a third of the population. Now, granted, some of those are probably doubles, but that's just that's how common that was. Uh, skipping ahead a little bit, the first FICO score was issued in 1989, and that score was determined to use mortgage eligibility for the first time in 1995. And that more or less brings us into modern day credit. So, so what does that mean for our present day and moving forward? Well, unfortunately, it doesn't look good. Uh, one of the sources I used for my research was an infographic that was sponsored by Equifax. And in the last part of the infographic, they did their usual uh, propaganda where they tried to say that spying on everyone will solve all our problems. And they talked about how limited financial data, like history of payments and income, are not always enough to be an accurate predictor of a person's credit worthiness. So they focused on all this stuff about how, you know, verifying your identities, the use of AI and neural networks is going to be awesome. And, you know, the obvious narrative there is the more data you give us, the better your life will be. And I think most of us would disagree with that assertion. Uh, I think data-driven decision-making will introduce new forms of financial oppression. For example, these days, uh, excuse me, these days corporations are trying to wield all kinds of data to control us financially. Just to name two examples, there are numerous startups that want to use your Facebook friends list to help calculate insurance rates. And American Express once lowered somebody's credit limit because they shopped at Walmart. So it's kind of wild that they would penalize you for saving money, but whatever. Um, yeah, like I said, the rise of data will introduce new and innovative ways to suppress people's opportunities and control us. You know, picking it, it'll force us to pick our friends based on how they benefit our credit credit rather than our emotional connection. So just to be clear, I don't think technology itself is bad. Uh, technology is going anywhere, and I don't think it should. I, I like my high-speed internet. Um, I made extensive use of music streaming services while I did this research. And right now, my wife is actually there at MoneroCon, and we've been talking every day thanks to Signal and the internet. So, you know, technology is great. It has a good side. But it's, it's all about how it's used. And all of the data that's being collected and analyzed and sold, and, you know, in, in the last however long I've been talking, I think 20 minutes, I, I just outlined how he who has the gold makes the rules. And all this data collection is putting us on unequal footing where somebody else has that advantage over us. And I didn't even touch on any of the recent financial issues for the record. I could go on for a whole hour uh, about all kinds of modern day examples of how financial regulations and money are used to oppress other people. So um, I said I didn't have a takeaway for this talk, but I, I did end up finding one as I was working on this. And my takeaway was that I hope this talk will remind us why things like Monero matter. Um, I said a second ago that tech isn't going anywhere, and I don't think it should, but it's also being weaponized against us. And so we need technology that works for us and protects us. Things like Monero that see a problem and find a solution. So uh, I just wanted to say for everyone who's giving a talk this weekend, um, thank you guys for helping be part of that solution. For everyone else who's attending and not speaking, uh, first off, thank you for listening to me speed read this. Uh, but also don't forget that you're part of this too by spreading the word and onboarding people and using Monero and being part of that Monero economy. So hopefully this talk was educational and reminds us all what we're fighting against and reminds us that we need something that levels the playing field and gives us all equal access to opportunity, just like the merchant bankers in Italy had and like the women of Athens had, because it, I, I think... I hope I made a pretty compelling case that when we all have equal opportunity, then we all rise and everyone does better and oppression falls like we saw in the Song Dynasty. 
And I personally think Monero could be one of those tools. So I'm excited I got to speak today. So thank you guys very much for your time and attention. Um, I, uh, I will be at my computer most of the day if you have any questions or want to copy that script. Like that. Thank you.